Today on the front porch, we have a very, very special group that's joining us behind a very, very special mission at Kansas State University. We're excited to talk about the Kanza Student Table. Now, maybe you've heard about it. We want to make sure you know about it. And if you haven't, to know about how you can maybe help and how this group is helping so many students in the K-State community. It's an exciting project that's been going on for a little while. We're joined on our first segments on the front porch by Vicki James. Vicki is the coordinator of the Food and Farm Council of Riley County in the city of Manhattan. We also have Father Gail Hammerschmidt from St. Isidore's Catholic Church and Abby Rouse, St. Isidore's Stewardship Director. Guys, thank you for joining us. I'm really excited to share your story and everyone's story that's going to be joining us on the front porch uh, with our listeners. So uh, let's, let's get into kind of why this thing started, I guess. Um, why did it begin and how did it begin? Vicki, I'll let you kind of start us and then we'll, we'll have everybody else jump in. Thank you, Rocky. I think I say from the entire Kansas Student Table team, we appreciate the opportunity to tell our story. And it's really one about the right people coming together in a community that cares about Kansas State University and their students. Uh, the Food and Farm Council was formed in the summer of 2018. Uh, it was a joint appointment of the uh, city and county commissions. And it was a really forward thinking idea so that there was a governing body that could really think about problems in our food system to make this a healthier place to live. One of the three things that we identified was food insecurity. Uh, Riley County has one of the highest rates of food insecurity in the state. And part of that is related to having a transient population where we have a military base and a university. So a lot of people coming and going. Uh, we identify with the fact that Kansas State University is like many um, universities across the country. Students have financial challenges. It's difficult to try to work part-time or full-time, go to school. Uh, not everybody has the opportunity to have funding without doing all of that. And so they have to make hard decisions. And sometimes those decisions are not choosing the healthiest food or not eating so you can pay a bill, things like that. So we were looking for somewhere near campus to have a meal program, maybe one or two nights a week, just to relieve our students from a little bit of the pressure. And we know that uh, Father Gail, Abby, and all of those involved with St. Isidore's Church, uh, the Catholic Student Center is very invested in our university students. A um, couple people said, hey, we know who you need to talk to. Next thing you know, I'm having a conversation with Father Gale. And the rest is history. He was so open. And we knew who to put together to do this. So, you know, Father Gale, share from your side of the, the story what that looked like when I showed up on your doorstep. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> so I, I first received an email, I think maybe from uh, Vicky or from a friend of Vicky's. And, and the connection was simply my, my little sister, who also is very much in, in the Manhattan community, doing a lot of good things. And she's kind of founded a, a group called Birthday in a Box, MHK, that helps uh, young uh, school students who cannot have, uh, you know, maybe their, their folks don't have enough money to provide a birthday party for them at the school or even uh, presents. And so she started a, a program here. And, and so through her connection with uh, maybe Food and Farm Council, and just the, the many people, the many entities in, in Manhattan that work very hard to help those in need out. Um, Vicki heard about my sister. She said, you know, there's a contact that knows Father Gale. It was my sister. We got in contact. And Vicki just said, here's what we would like to do. This is something that I've been dreaming of really since I've arrived here in Manhattan three and a half years ago. At that point, it was, it was three years. And I just, it seemed right. It absolutely seemed right. I think that the whole idea of service is what we are about here at St. Isidore's. We are so incredibly blessed. We are building a new church. The church that we had was not uh, quite big enough to, to hold all of the, the people we needed to hold. And so for many years, we've been working to build funds so that we could build a new church. And I recognize as I'm out raising funds, I mean, millions of dollars, that if all we're doing is, is raising money, and we become just about building this beautiful church on the corner of Denison and Anderson, but we're not really living out the rest of the mission of what it means to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, of you know, looking out for those who are most in need. 
then we're failing. I'm failing our students. And if I'm here to train K-State students that come to St. Isidore's how to live life well, then I've got to train them in, in giving and, and looking out for their, their neighbors in need and then doing everything that they can to support their neighbors in need, regardless of who that neighbor is. And so this was just exactly what I was looking for. Vicki came to me with this dream, with this vision. And I said, you've got my full, full, full support. Um, maybe Abby, if you even wanna just talk a little bit about how that came to be, then like within the first weeks uh, of just donors even falling in place, including some of these people maybe who are going to be even on some of the, the future segments of, of this uh, uh, program today. I think maybe Abby, if you'd say a word or two. Yeah, um, I was living in Georgia at the time when I got hired at St. Isidore's and um, Father Gail, I knew Father Gail from college. And so um, when it was time for me to came, come back, we had just started talking about what that would look like. And I hadn't even moved back to Kansas yet. And Father Gail texts me and he says, hey, there's a Zoom at 1.30 tomorrow for this new thing. It's going to be part of your job. Can you be on it? And I was like, I'm at the beach right now. And so I can't. And so, uh, but once I did actually move back to Manhattan, um, this was something that I got so excited about. And immediately I was like, yeah, this is, this is right. Um, and so I was really thankful that that happened. And then honestly, within the first couple of weeks, um, the person who had my position before me hadn't even left yet. And so we were working side by side and donors just started to hear about this. And honestly, the whole thing was just made possible um, by all of the pieces just falling in our lap. And so I thought that was really awesome. And just like a sign that we were moving in the right direction as well. I think it's a little, go ahead. If we need, yeah, if we need, it was almost like within the first 10 days, if we needed verification that we were doing the right thing, some of those phone calls that we were receiving that made us realize that this thing's gonna be able to be funded legitimately for easily for the first year, just based on like three phone calls. Uh, mm -hmm. it, was, it was the verification we needed. And we're like, Vicki, thank you for calling us. Thank you <laughs> for inspiring this because uh, this, is, this is exactly, I think, what we needed and what, what the university was. It, it seems like this story is getting some attention and, and energy behind it, which it should have. But I think a lot of people find this to be a COVID thing. And it's not. Obviously, it was before COVID ever entered, although you had to deal with the pandemic. I guess talk about the steps to continue on as that happened. And I know your story is that nothing was going to stop you from continuing to deliver these meals. Uh, it's a huge project to undertake every week, but you guys made it happen. Well, I think that's really true, Rocky. Food insecurity was a problem pre-COVID. It's been a systemic problem in this community for a long time and on university campuses. So it, it got worse because of COVID. Um, if you think about a lot of the jobs that our K-State students have, um, they lost those jobs or they were paused because of the shutdown. Uh, even when things began to open a little bit, not a lot of those jobs came back or people got COVID, they had to be quarantined. So all sorts of things that created a very complex problem being even more complex happened with COVID. I think what's really special here is we were going to execute this um, whether COVID happened or not and in spite of COVID. So that's what's so special about all these segments that you're gonna hear from all our partners today is being able to provide a, a hot meal that's cold packed so students can warm it up when they're ready, a brown bag breakfast they can put in their backpack for the next day. Um, the fact that it's being done by university students ordering, preparing, and packaging the food, volunteer students serving others, and with COVID pandemic protocol, non-contact delivery. Um, Abby likes to tease, we've became the Chick-fil-A um, on <laughs> campus trying to serve our university students and you know our, our partners that help make sure this is nutritious food. This was about, we didn't want this to be a empty calorie snack. We didn't want this to be something out of a vending machine that was high sugar, high fat. This was intended to give a little bit of stress relief, mental relief, and physical and emotional nourishment to university students at least one night a week and the next morning. 
So for people to think that is, as COVID steps back or as nice weather comes, that the problem has left the, the university or the community, I really want people to recognize all our K-State friends and family, we still need donors, we still need volunteers, and we're here for the long haul. We have students ask us, are you gonna be here this summer? Are you gonna be here next fall? We're building relationships, and this is a program that we, we want to be uh, very embedded in being a community, church, and hopefully university um, type of partnership for a really long time. It's a huge project. It's a huge project. Real quickly, I'll just I'll jump in here. We've got a couple of minutes left here to uh, to discuss, but it's a huge project. And I think being in it for the long haul is really impressive to point out because it's easy to get something started and people to get excited about it. It's hard to sustain that excitement and energy and money to keep it going. Father Gill, you had another point to make. Well, you know, so one of the things that happened early on was that we did know that that this could be a test process. We could throw it out there and see if it works because of COVID. We could say this is a six month or a one year thing. And if it didn't work, we were willing to sustain it for six months to a year and then say, okay, it, it wasn't the perfect idea. Uh, COVID is hopefully coming to a close. And so now we don't need this anymore, even though we would have known all along that no, we're still gonna need it. And we just need to figure something else out. Luckily, this is working perfectly well. And so it will definitely extend well beyond COVID. You, you know, we talk about, I think Vicki said, it's a, it's a church thing, it's a community thing, but it's also uh, a, a worldwide thing. It's an international thing. Uh, so many of our international students are coming to receive meals and it's fun for us to meet people that we would have never met from other countries uh, to see the smile on their faces. And, and, you know, to be an international student is not, uh, it's not easy to come to a different country to study. Uh, maybe because of the, the costs of coming to another country to study, even if you have great scholarships, it's expensive. And so to, these are, are some of our, our main uh, customers, the, the people that come by to receive. And, they, and boy, nobody's more grateful than these folks. And it just makes all of us so overjoyed to be able to do what we're doing as well for the, the international students here at K-State. And it makes K-State better. And that's, that's the thing that excites me, being a graduate, uh, being the chaplain here on the Catholic, at the Catholic Church that's connected with K-State. I, I love it when K-State does uh, well, when it's thriving, and this is something that helps it thrive. And very, very much so. Um, I will mention real quickly that uh, the food insecurities is real. I know you guys have talked about it, but and it is worldwide, but to be able to help those students that may not know where uh, a meal at any time is coming from, to know they can rely on one each week is really, really impressive. Guys, I'm gonna shift gears for a minute. We're gonna invite, invite in Erica Bauer, who is the Hospitality Management Instructor, Lacey's Fresh Fair and Catering Manager at K-State, and Kelly White here, Assistant Director, Dining Support Services, Housing and Dining Services Instructor, Department of Food, Nutrition, Dietetics, and Health, Kansas State University. So for you guys, let's talk first about Lacey's Housing and Dining. Um, talk about how this, came to be and then how it helps with this mission? Well, I can kick it off here. Um, Great, first of all, Kelly. Vicki, I would say. Uh, Vicki reached out um, to me and we kind of had this little brainstorming Zoom session with a lot of us that are here on the, you know, on the screen and we were talking about who out there can provide great meals that are tasty, nutritious, and really do tie into the Gay State campus and the whole focus of Kansas Student Table. And Lacey's was just one of those first ones that popped up. You know, it's student focused, it's student run, and it just fit right in there to that mission. And so along comes Erica, you know? <laughs> and so Erica, what was your first um, touch of this project and then your first thoughts on it? Well, uh, my department head, he actually approached me and he came over and said, hey, we've got this idea for this project. Do you want to take it on? Because I'm a newer faculty member here at K-State. And he, I'm like, absolutely. He described it to me and I said, there's no hesitation in this. We have to do this. Um, so, you know, I was able to coordinate with Vicki and the team and we were able to come up with some ideas of how this was going to be run. And then, you know, we've got COVID going on. So I actually took like my food service training and all of those ideas and concepts and came up with a good COVID protocol for service, as well as production of the food as well to keep the students safe. 
Um, I told my students, if you have a sniffle, you do not attend class. I don't care. <laughs> you know, go see a doctor, give me an excuse and come back the next day and find out what that sniffle is. Um, Cause I want to keep that kitchen as safe and as clean as possible. Um, so my students came in, I described what we're going to do each week. And at first I thought they weren't going to be really excited about it. I thought they were going to be like, Hey, I have, I'm, I'm paying tuition and I'm making food for others. I don't understand this. Um, but and it, but then it turned into them actually enjoying what they're preparing and they, they actually have a feeling and an emotion behind it now of why they do what they do um, in my class of commercial food production management. Um, so they actually enjoy making food for cons at table each week because um, like they said, they have the international aspect to it. So we try to keep our menus as international as possible. I try not to repeat anything. Um, I go outside of my limits and I teach myself and I actually involve other individuals to um, create menus that, you know, are of the international variety. Like we've made food from like the national dish of um, Saudi Arabia. Um, we've made food from Morocco. We've made food from India. We've made food from South Africa. Um, so, you know, we keep those in mind when we create our menus. So my students enjoy learning and creating those items that they normally would not have here if they just based it on the food that we serve here, mainly in Kansas. So it's been a great ride for all of my students. Or your the part, go ahead, Kelly, no, please go ahead. I was going to say, another thing to add on there is, you know, we, we talk about how we want this tasty, easy to serve, safe food, but Erica just threw in there, we're also there to educate the community and the students. So we're giving them this culture that they don't always get their hands on, as well as the fact that we're hitting some nutritional standards as well. We're trying to get some whole grains in there and proteins because we need it to be able to sustain what they're here for. They're here to get an education. And to do that, you need to be healthy. You need to have a nutritious diet. And even if it's just, it's just that one dinner meal and that breakfast for the next day, it's enough to sustain them a little bit longer for that week. I was gonna ask from your departments, the week leading up to a Wednesday, does it begin Wednesday night after the meal or, or how does that week look like? Um, a week planning for me, typically um, I will start preparing sometimes even on a Friday, um, but normally um, my students make all the food on Tuesday. So all the food comes in on a Monday um, um, from my delivery. And then we move on and we prepare all of the food in house on a Tuesday. We chill it over at night and then we pack it on a Wednesday morning. So my, my two rotations of my class can actually be involved in the whole entire process. Um, so it's a great thing, you know, just to start off, but sometimes, you know, I have to start a little bit earlier um, if I need to marinate and meet for a longer period of time or something like that, you know, or, or, you know, have something sit and rest for a bit. So I have to start that a couple of days prior, but um, you know, it takes a lot of planning. Absolutely. I love the, the culture you brought up. Kelly, a moment ago that you're teaching these students. Um, I also love your motto, students preparing food for students to serve fellow students. I mean, that's very impressive. As you said, Erica, that they bought in and, and enjoy and look forward to this, but you have to be proud of, of the departments and what they have uh, taught the, the students to want to do and to be able to do as well. Oh, ab absolutely. These students enjoy serving each other. And sometimes in some cases, they're even preparing a meal for themselves and they don't know it. Because um, uh, some of my students, they even go over and they pick up meals because they're, the, they're the student that's in need. And they'll, they'll go over there and pick up those meals and there's no shame in it. If, I've, if I see any students that I know, there's no shame involved. You know, it's just go over your hunger, you're, you need a food. That's it, that's a basic necessity. Come on over, there's no stigma attached to it whatsoever. Um, so the students that I have in class actually go over there and get a meal sometimes and they enjoy it. So it nourishes them and it makes me feel happy that they're able to get that product from us. And seeing the smile on those students' faces when we hand them the meals and when the other students are handing them the meals is very rewarding for those of us that are helping and the core team, but we also have all the student volunteers. And we never seem to have a lack of that. There's always, in fact, there's usually like a waiting list or extras or our, you know, our volunteer list fills up quickly with those students as Abby grabs onto them. So I think we're also educating our volunteers how to be giving in our community and help them out as well. Yeah, great points. And Erica, you mentioned the stigma, the shame. I know I've read different articles where students, there's other places to get free food in Manhattan. But the comments from the students were they felt they were taking it away from people that maybe needed it more than they did. So this is a way for them to really value it, but also know it's for them from you guys, which 
what a family at K-State, huh? No, oh, absolutely. It's, it's the community supporting itself to keep itself healthy. Um, so it's pretty awesome. And the, the, the student, like I, we mentioned, the students serving students serving students, it's like, you know, it's, it, it's, it's just an awesome process of how it flows. And um, I have yet to have one student complain about scooping another portion of rice. You know, <laughs> they're like, they're like they, they, they know that there's a reason and a purpose and a meaning behind it. And they understand, you know, there's people out there in need and I'm not one of those individuals right now. But in the future, you know, I, I always try to instill in my students, you know, just to learn from this process and give back. You know, if you've taken a meal and you get to that point in life where, you know, you're stable enough, try to give back in some capacity. You know, it might not be in five years, it might not be in 10 years, but if it's in 20 years, you know, and you're able, you're stable enough to do so, you know, remember this time and give that back at some point. You guys have some new partnerships with the program. Talk about that for us. Um, so for the previous two weeks, we've had um, a partnership with the Asian American Student Union. It's a club here at K-State. And they actually approached me in the fall semester. Um, they have a basically a dinner that they put on um, during the month of uh, April um, for the Asian American Heritage Month. And they were unable to have that meal. So they approached me and said, hey, how can I get how can we get our food out there? And I'm like, I've got cons a table. Um, so Dr. Thur Sarah Thurston from the international office, she actually introduced the, the two of us, um, the president of the club. And I, and we just talked about, you know, items that we could potentially produce. And we actually produced those items the previous two weeks. And uh, the students of that club actually came into my kitchen and they taught me how to make these items so that I could make them as authentic as I possibly could from their nationality. Um, so they, it was kind of cool having the students teach me some food that I have never made before. Um, so they had a great time coming in my kitchen, teaching me how to make this. And they're like, no, 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 don't do it this way. You know, <laughs> they even taught me how to say the, pronounce the words correctly to, for the dishes itself. So we actually joked around and had a great time. Um, and one of the items that we came up with was a banh mi sandwich. Um, so it's a Vietnamese sandwich. And, um, we, I'm like, well, where am I going to get this bread? You know, it's a specialty item. Where am I going to find this bread? Um, so I actually thought about it and I'm like, we've got, uh, we have a baking science club here on campus. So I contact the baking science club president and he, and I said, Hey, you know, I need 450 Vietnamese rolls. Can you make them? And he's like, let's talk to the club president and you talk to the club president. And then all of a sudden, you know, I've got 450 rolls coming my way for the Bon Mi sandwich. Um, so it's basically, you know, finding the resources on campus and, you know, just putting them all together to make something beautiful like Kanza table. Yeah, it's great stuff. Kelly, Erica, thank you so much. We're going to move into the next part of our uh, Front Forge conversation and talk about uh, uh, building new partnerships. We'll invite in Debbie Morrison is with us uh, and Kathy Lacey. Debbie's with Kansas Student Table Donor, Cats Cover Donor, Board Member, KSU Trustee, Parents, and uh, Family Association Board. Kathy Lacey, a founding donor of Lacey's Fresh Fair and Catering, uh, Kansas Student Table Donor, Cats Cover Donor, Board Member, KSU trustee. So ladies, thanks for joining us here and, and uh, being a part of our conversation on the front porch. I know that both of you talk about giving back to the KSU family because you're a part of it from its, your roots to now where you're at in your business businesses. Um, so talk to that being a part of the, the, the KSU family. Kathy, you want to start with us? Um, I was going to pass it off to Debbie, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead and try. Rocky, i would um the reason we started the lacy production kitchen catering was to give the students experience in catering and event planning etc and it was kind of a perfect storm how this all happened um so how do these kids during during pandemic time when there's no events or any catering that's engaged how do we give them any experience in this production kitchen and then all of a sudden these people came together, um, Father Gail, uh, Debbie approached and Erica had solutions for all of it uh, to engage the students in this Gonza table where they could come up with menus and put box lunches together and keep the food safe and make it nutritious. And it was a great experience for the students, uh, a learning experience. They got to do their catering. Um, 
Plus they got to learn how to give back to the community, become a real community builder and learn how important it is to uh, be an integral part of helping other people in need. Debbie, yeah, you can speak to this as well because I know you and Charlie uh, went to K-State and still are very involved with K-State and with Father Gale and, and St. Isidore's, but giving back to your K-State family, I know it's very important to both of you. Well, um, I was one of those students that Vicki talked about, one of the students who was putting herself through college when my husband met me. Um, and I, I barely had enough, made enough money to pay my rent and food was the last thing on my budget. I remember sitting in a lot of classrooms trying to stay focused on my studies, but doodling on the side on my notebook of what I had in my checkbook how many hours I had to work to meet the bills that I had and what I was gonna have left over. And food was one of the last things I paid for. Um, my first two years at K-State, I was in a dorm. And like I said, I paid my way through college. I had student loans, but it didn't pay all the bills. And on the months that I couldn't pay my dorm bill up front, my food ticket was held. And I can tell you there was probably one week every month I went without being able to go to the dorm to eat and I would have my roommate bring me a piece of fruit. Um, and that stuck with me. I, it stuck with me for a long time. Um, even when I was in apartments, you know, had to pay the rent before I could go to the grocery store. Um, and so as we started, as I got married while I was at K-State and we struggled, I totally understand food insecurity. The irony of it, my husband is in the restaurant business and has made our made our family fortune by serving food to other people. And so when Father Gail approached us, he had no idea how big of a passion this has always been for us. I um, I actually ran a food pantry here in Texas for seniors who are homebound and um, sharing the harvest where we grow fresh produce and I take it out to seniors. So to be able to help other K-State students survive and make it through college by helping feed them, is the only way a family a family takes care of each other. And giving back was what we've always said we've always wanted to do and help train and teach our own kids to give to those because you never know when you're in that going to be in that situation yourself. How how wonderful is it, for lack of any better word, for you two that have that have been a part of making this happen through donations to see it take off in the manner it has. And to hear the stories of how much the students enjoy helping each other and how much this does mean to each and every student, it, it's got to be a little overwhelming and, and I would think make your heart glow some, wouldn't it? It does. And I, I have to share that um, I have a son who's in the hospitality management, one of Erica's students right now, and his girlfriend. And to hear them talk, um, I know they may not have been right in the production of this, but it, the kids are talking about it. And what an opportunity to teach this group of graduates on how to feed food insecure, because there's food insecurity all through this country. And we, it's a growing problem that we need to be able to address. Um, but it's, it's amazing for me. So, Kathy? Yeah, I think it's quite amazing to watch. Um, we live in Des Moines, Iowa, and very familiar with the restaurant industry and and we see the restaurants in Iowa how they've given back and what they've done for the insecure people there and uh, we were already doing it at K-State and so it's so much fun to tell people this fabulous story about I still call it a perfect storm we're looking for students to have an experience to feed the students a nutritious meal and everybody needs to be responsible and how we can give back. It's a tremendous story to tell and it's so much fun to tell and it wouldn't have happened without the efforts of everybody here on this call today. Yeah, well, hats off to, to you guys and to our entire group here on the front porch and that will welcome everybody back in and and kind of get some some final thoughts on on the Kanza student table. It's just such a an awesome project and mission as we've talked about. Now we've talked about getting it going, the energy to start it that that comes, the energy to keep it going. You can tell that there's enough passion amongst just this group here to keep it going. I, I can see that. But what is next for the Kanza student table? I mean, where do you go from here? 
Vicki, maybe you want to jump in again and, and kind of lead that conversation? Well, I think this group has known me long enough to know that I'm a, a visionary. And what we're doing today, I'm already thinking down the road, right? <laughs> um, and I've already mentioned COVID has left us with an even greater issue than we already had. So it's, it's not going away anytime soon. Um, we've had conversations about maybe this becomes a two night a week. Uh, maybe we utilize two different locations, uh, get more partners involved. How, how, what else you know, can we do? And certainly when we think about Kansas State and all of the amazing um, expertise that we have, all the different groups, um, that's what you're seeing here are some pieces of the puzzle put together with expertise. So if we just vision what could this look like, how many more students could we involve with uh, experiences that will help them in their future careers, but also trying to diminish and, and decrease food insecurity for our university students. Uh, there are numerous things that could happen. So we just keep having conversations, building relationships, partnerships, and keep talking about what the needs are. And we're going to keep moving along. I think one thing you could talk about, and I, I'll just open it up to, to anyone, but food insecurity is not going away. Um, you've taken it away for one night, and that is that is amen to making that happen, but it's not going to go away, so the future is something you've got to keep working toward, and, and again, I, I use the word energy, but our Rotary Club will do projects, our station will do projects, and it's easy to do it once, and then the second time, it's, it's, it's not too bad, but that next time, it, it loses steam. Um, so to keep the, the power going, I think, is, is very, very important for you guys. And, and obviously, you guys have the passion, I think, to, to, to move that train. Any thoughts on going forward with this? Any other uh, projects that you think might be happening? How about this? What will it look like once COVID and it's starting to inch that way? I can't imagine uh, Father Gale and for the students to be able to actually sit down together and enjoy one of these meals. Right. Would that not be awesome? Well, and see, and that's, that's one of our hopes, too, because while we recognize that there's food insecurity, there's also just insecurity in regards to human interaction and, and people being able to just look at one another and, and smile and share a conversation. And so, you know, also a part of our, our building renovation is just going to be providing some spaces where that might be able to take place. When we run Kansas Student Table, we'll have a couple different tents where we hand out food for people that drive through and they grab their to-go box and they take off. But then we also have a table where it's a, it's a walk-up table. And you can just see by, by hanging out at that walk-up table that people, they want interaction. They want to continue talking. I think generally Abby sits at that table and works the, the walk-up table. And, and she, she's made friends already. She, the people keep coming back. They know each other's names. And now imagine if we can go from there to actually even sitting down at table together and, uh, and just sharing stories. You think about the many stories that you could, you could uh, just, the, the things we could learn if we just sat and listened to other people, uh, especially the, the, the diversity that comes through our line. I would be incredible for, I know for all of our St. Isidore students, for the volunteers, but I, I would hope, uh, you know, for everybody involved. I guess I'll give each of you a chance to maybe have a, a parting thought, a feeling, a future ideas. Erica, because you're on my screen this way, I'll start with you. Well, well, for me, each week when we do this program, you know, it makes me very happy, but it also makes me very sad at the same time. Um, it makes me happy that we can fill a void for some students every week, but then it also makes me sad that we can't fill the entire void and it's going to be a continuous problem. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, that happy, sad feeling like, you know, we can do our part for a portion of it, but we can't solve the problem. Um, the problem is going to be consistently there no matter what, but food insecurity, you know, you're always going to have it and just progressing and moving on from there. And, you know, being able to support the community as best as we can. Um, so that's what I like to say about the ending of this. And it's just like an awesome program. My students talk about it all the time. They actually get upset with me because I'm so passionate about it. Sometimes they're like, Erica, be quiet. Stop talking about cons of table during lecture. Um, but they, they just, they understand the passion and then they're actually catching that, that little buzz in my ear and about, about it. And they're like, they get excited about it each week after they get over that, that, that initial hump. 
<laughs> but um, you know, going through this process with them, you know, they're thinking about what can I do? How can I donate? How can I continue to be a part of this after I graduate? So they're actually learning from this. And one of my questions that I have for them in the class at the end of the semester is, how would you initiate a nonprofit and a business that you would have in the future? How would you give back? Um, so I, I, I try to plant that little seed of how to give back to your community to sustain your community. That's great. Kelly? Well, I'm going to take a little bit more of a selfish view on this one. Um, when I, you know, I work in an operation where we're feeding 2,000 students a day, handing food away all day. But when I show up on Wednesday nights, it is a completely different feeling. It is the most enlightening. Like I leave Wednesday nights and I'm in the best mood ever all week. Um, because they are so gracious. It's just a completely di different atmosphere. You're not just handing them food. You're handing them a conversation. Vicki and I are often the ones asking the students coming through the one tent, how many meals do you need? And we chat with them while they're waiting. You know, how's your day going? Our finals coming up. Are you going to be around this summer? So it's also that relationship for them. And they get to know us. And it's almost funny because, you know, we have people who windows don't roll down. Or we have ones who always have the dog in the back seat, And we know them now. So it's become a whole other community around this Konza table situation. And so I just encourage anyone out there who thinks that they need just something else in their life, reach out if you can donate time, if you have funds to donate. I think this is a great community, yet K-State student-focused initiative that you could be a part of. Yeah, awesome. Abby? Yeah, I think for me, um, my parting thought has a lot to do with what Father Gale was saying. It's my absolute dream to have a bunch of tables set up in that parking lot and be able to see students sharing a meal together because, yeah, food insecurity is a big issue here, but we also absolutely need human connection. And I think that this is a, a great avenue to be able to do that through. Um, I would say that one of the most cherished takeaways for me from this project is um, yeah, the faces and names that fill my heart now. And I would say that any effort in food insecurity, um, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, it, it is like all in vain if your heart isn't full of those faces and those names of the people that you're serving. And so I think that that um, is like really beautiful. And it would be even cooler to see like those same faces and names like getting to know each other um getting to meet people that they've never gotten to meet before and so i think that that is yeah the, the dream and hopefully where we're moving with this amen kathy i had to move because they're mowing, mowing outside and it's pretty loud so <laughs> i found my mute button i what i hope that this moves into other communities uh, and other people are willing, well, I know they're willing, but it's more of the marketing to get more people involved. Uh, I've gotten emails, I've gotten texts, you know, what's interesting when this first started out, some friends of mine, they would text me and say, have you heard of the Gonza table? And I'm going, oh yeah, by the way, I have. And Lacey's Kitchen is providing the food right now. How do we give back? How do we support this? And it's, I'm hoping we can get more uh, communities involved in giving back and more people volunteering on the nights that we give the food away as maybe there will be another night during the week that we have the ability to do this. It's just very exciting. And what's the most fun for me is, I think this is gonna go on for a long time. It's not diminishing, it's only growing. Great, Debbie? You know, K-State likes to talk about family. We use the word family a lot. And to me, this is family, serving our own, taking care of our own. But I will tell you that Vicki and Erica have, have motivated me and encouraged me to get back into being involved in my own community here in Texas and starting to get more active and pick up some of the things I let go a while ago to help that food insecure, because it is, it's in all communities. So um, playing it forward. Terrific, yeah, Father Gale. Yeah, you know, I was just saying, part of the reason that we're on it in the midst of our media blitz right now is because we just uh, gave out our 10,000th meal. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe a year ago, I hadn't even met any of these uh, partners. And now we've handed out quite a bit more than 10,000 meals just because of these last few weeks. 
it's amazing. And so me being obviously a religious person, <laughs> it's amazing what God can do when he sees human hearts trying to cooperate with his will. And um, I'm blown away by it. Uh, we've had an incredible amount of generosity handed uh, and, and put really like put in our hands to then use the generosity to, to make this program possible. Always looking for, for more people to, to join the mission, to join the mission. You know, there's different ways that you can do it. The, the, one of the main ways is just through St. Isidore's. If you would donate to St. Isidore's, St. Isidore's.com, uh, S-T-I-S-I-D-O-R-E-S.com. And there's a donate buttons and you can even designate it then explicitly to uh, Kanza student table. And we make sure we, that you know, our, our accountants are incredible, that all of that money gets spent exactly where it needs to get spent. That's probably right now the best way to, to join the team and to make sure that this really does continue into the, uh, I would love to come back on and celebrate our, our 100,000th meal that we've handed away. Um, so let's just keep the ball rolling. That's what I have to say, let's keep the ball rolling. Well put, and we will link uh, your link on our social media and, and uh, websites when we share this this interview. So to make sure people can donate, Vicky, um, as Father Gail said, keep the ball rolling. Obviously, you were the one that started the ball rolling. What are your final thoughts? I've been quoted as saying over the years, a lot of years, doing this kind of work, that going to college is the most special time and the most challenging time all rolled in together. So it's exciting, it's energizing, it's hard work, it's got a lot of ups and downs. So whether a student um, is really food insecure on a daily basis or just needs a lift, I think the exciting part for me is every Wednesday night, knowing that we have touched lives and I'm like everybody else. I come home and my husband can't believe the great mood I'm in. He's like, why don't you do this every night? It's kind of the joke we have. So for those K-State students, you just can't imagine. Their eyes are wide. They're appreciative. They're thankful. Um, yes, last night I was saying something about, are you ready for finals? And all of a sudden, people are just chatting away. They're telling me they're excited. They're scared. On and on. They just, I think COVID also created isolation. And our university students are, for the most part, a lot of busy people that like to get out there and be social. So this has also became an outlet for giving back a tiny bit of normalcy, if you will, in that they're getting to connect with some people that really care and are expressing that they care through what we say, um, just how we approach them, high-fiving the little kids in the back seat through the windows, and then nourishing them. Uh, the partnerships here, you know, we have our ups and downs. We're people working together, but we're committed uh, to each other and to this program, but we couldn't do it without everybody here. And we do need volunteers and donations. Uh, this is the only way that's going to happen to sustain what our university students need. If you're looking for, uh, real quickly to follow up on that statement, looking for volunteers, we'll, we'll find ways for them to get money to you with the link we'll share. But if what are the volunteers you're needing? How would someone get into helping out with that? Yeah, um, if anyone wants to volunteer, they can send me an email. Um, it's a rouse at st isadores.com, st isadores.com. Um, you can also find my email on the website. Um, you can also call us um, if you can't find the email. Our phone number is uh, on the out there on the internet, and so yeah. That would be great if anyone wants to volunteer. Specifically, people also, uh, we need people every week, but if you're going to be in the area this summer, um, we'll need some volunteers as some of the students who normally volunteer um, go home for the summer. Very good. My hat's off to each and every one of you for uh, your heartfelt mission and to making it happen and to continue it on to 100,000 meals, our next goal that we'll look forward to. Thank you all so much for being with us here on the front porch.